Though its name may be simple, there is nothing quite straightforward about the hunger that killed a million innocent people across Ireland. The needless deaths were the cost of much more than just an absence of viable potato crops. So, what really happened? The potato was introduced to Ireland as far back as the late 1500s and began to be planted there shortly after. In a matter of time, despite the only mass-produced potato growing in Ireland being the Irish lumper, the food became a staple in the daily Irish diet, especially for the underprivileged and for nearly everyone during the winter months. Packed with nutrients and easily accessible, potatoes virtually became a necessity for the Irish population. In addition, many of the other crops grown in Ireland were done so on land owned by rich landlords and shipped off as exports for the British Empire, which would prove utterly disastrous as the mid-19th century rolled around. The famine began in 1845. In August of that year, the first signs of water mold popped up in southern England. The initial reaction was really not much of one and it only took a month for the blight to spread into Ireland. Curiously, many early warnings of this now imminent famine had been generally ignored. The blight had already hit Mexico and inched up to the United States over a year prior, and there was good reason to believe that at some point, the fungus would unintentionally be brought back to the British Isles. And yet, even as the potatoes in Ireland began to fall victim to the blight, the British government, Ireland's authority, seemed unwilling to acknowledge that there was a real problem afoot. When the first potatoes began to be dug up in October, British Prime Minister Robert Peel went as far as saying that Irish news tended to exaggerate, and thus it was too soon to know if the damning reports of the infestation were accurate or not. He did eventually respond later in the month by summoning an emergency meeting that would lead to a push to repeal the Corn Laws and a move to set up a scientific commission to investigate the extent of the problem over in Ireland. Still, the Brits weren't entirely on the same page when it came to how to respond, and the matter remained far from simple. November brought about an array of new and negative developments that only complicated matters. For one, the Scientific Commission found that around half of Ireland's potato crops had been lost to blight. Another matter was the bulk purchase of Indian and American corn to distribute throughout Ireland in hopes of counteracting the effects of the potato loss. Added political debate and borderline chaos back in London furthermore meant that little else would be done to help the Irish for the time being. It wouldn't be until spring of the following year that Peel decided to set up a program allowing Irish citizens opportunities in public work so they could earn money to buy more food. But the Prime Minister was forced to resign shortly after and was replaced by Lord John Russell. The new Whig administration did a near-complete reversal of Peel's approach, which was already falling short of stopping the famine. Their new laissez-faire strategy, however, was drastically worse than the minimal effort that had been put in thus far. The Russell government believed that the situation would resolve itself without their interference. Or rather, many of them simply didn't want to interfere, as they believed that the famine was a punishment on the Irish from God. Subsequently, all relief efforts were halted and the Irish were left to fend for themselves as the death toll brought on by the growing famine began to rise. As the British authorities continued to export grains from Ireland, tens increased to hundreds, increased to thousands of Irish citizens without food, work, or money. The death toll was rising. Even the Quakers attempted to send as much relief as they could to the Irish, consequently outdoing the authorities themselves. This contemporary version of a Salvation Army, however, was unable to fully prevent the rising death toll or continued blight, but they nevertheless saved at least a few grateful citizens in their attempts. Finally, 
In early 1847, the British government decided to show some bit of concern, this time passing the Temporary Relief Act, or Soup Kitchen Act, which, predictably, opened a system of soup kitchens to distribute free food to the struggling Irish. This food, of course, was scarcely worthy of the definition, as it was no more than mushy grain soup fed in ridiculously small quantities, and the soup kitchens were closed in September. This disaster of a response was by now causing a massive uptick in emigration. But the sudden increase in Irish citizens fleeing the famine caused a disaster at sea as well. The ships used by these emigrants became known as coffin ships due to the vast swaths of their passengers dying due to starvation and disease along their way to the New World. And of all the Irish fleeing on these ships, many were doing so after being evicted by their British landlords, who often hoped to profit off the current suffering of the poorer citizens and farmers. Furthermore, in Ireland, the famine was ramping back up, and a new cholera outbreak joined it in wiping out thousands upon thousands of lives throughout 1848 and the following years. Cholera and blight hit just the same in 1849, and many view the famine as not having ended until 1852. In 1851, as the potato blight was finally fizzling out, it was estimated that at least one million Irish men, women, and children were killed by starvation, while at least another million had left the country, a trend that was far from ending. Then and even now, Many in Ireland blame the British government for starving their people and causing so many to flee. But what about other governments? How did others react? Possibly the most remarkable show of support from the international community came from none other than the Ottoman Empire. Sultan Khalifa Abdul Majid I, believed to have been driven by his own religious beliefs, decided that it would be his duty to send aid to Ireland. He opted, thus, to donate £10,000, but this immediately drew unhappy attention from the British authorities. That might have been because Queen Victoria herself had only sent £2,000 to the Irish and couldn't accept being shown up by the Turks. She consequently asked the Sultan to only send £1,000, which he reluctantly agreed to do. Still though, Sultan Khalifa wasn't satisfied with providing such a small donation and followed the monetary aid by secretly sending five ships filled with food to Ireland. The British found out about this sneaky addition nevertheless and attempted to block the ships from reaching Ireland. But the Turks were determined and the food arrived at the Drogheda Harbour under Ottoman protection allowing the food to be handed off to the Irish. Other nations played a role in aiding the starving population as well. Donations were gathered and sent from people as far as Barbados, Jamaica, St. Kitts, and even India. Similarly, even across the pond in the United States, a significant effort was made throughout multiple states and indigenous communities to lend a hand and relieve the pressure from the famine. Yet sadly, even with all of the help from foreigners and locals alike, the blight itself ravaged Ireland and its population, and the effects were far from over. Even today, Ireland's population has failed to match what it was prior to the famine's outbreak, and it falls short by millions. The initial million or so emigrants that the starvation caused only accounts for those who left in the midst of it, but for decades after, the Irish were still seeing consequences. Between 1851 and 1900, it's believed that over 4 million emigrants continued to leave Ireland in hopes of a better life and possibly out of fear of another famine hitting in the future. The potato also became much less prevalent over the years after the blight disappeared, and it seems that the share of potato crops amongst the total Irish crops per year went from over 50% in the 1840s down to a stunning 12.5% in 1900. This wasn't necessarily a bad thing, and made the Irish less dangerously reliant on one crop. 
but it nevertheless shows a drastic effect of the famine even years later. The mass death and emigration would additionally decrease the Irish-speaking population from roughly 30% to less than 20% and anti-British sentiment was on the rise due to the response, or lack thereof, from the exact government that was supposed to help the Irish. It goes without saying that the Great Potato Famine was a horrific disaster for the people of Ireland in the late 1800s, but sometimes people forget that the shockwaves it left behind haven't stopped even today.